Coming up, the presidential election. What you need to know. Then, what's on your mind? Hi, this is Nora calling from Houston, Texas. Um, why can't kids vote until they're 18 or older? Also ahead, making a difference. One student's efforts lead to an extra day off from school. We have all the details for you coming up. Plus, terrific dog, how this black lad became a superstar on the field. And calling all the young Sheldon fans, actor Montana Jordan sits down with Kids Edition to talk about the popular show and a new spinoff. In this new show, we're about, uh, let's see, we are starting three months after young Sheldon ended. What's it like filming the show in front of a live audience? Yeah, I mean, it's it's something I've never done before, you know? Have you ever been in an audience before, like in front of an audience? Yeah. Have you? Well, it's pretty nerve-wracking, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, on this, we film on Tuesday nights. So every Tuesday night, there's 180 people just looking right at you as, you, as you're working. So that can be pretty nerve-wracking. This is NBC Nightly News, Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. It's great to be with you. We have a terrific lineup ahead, including our picture of the week. It's a fun one. Plus, we'll put you to the test in our pop quiz. And a bit later on, secrets of those corn mazes. But before we get to all of that, we want to bring you the latest information we have at this time on the presidential election. Thanks, Lester. Well, kids, this week is definitely one for the history books. NBC News projects Donald Trump has been elected the 47th president of the United States, winning a second term in office in a decisive victory over Vice President Kamala Harris. The historic win comes four years after he was voted out of office. Donald Trump will now be the first president since Grover Cleveland to return to office after losing an election. He also is the oldest person elected at the age of 78. Now, Vice President Kamala Harris conceded the election, meaning she acknowledged she lost the election and called Donald Trump after the results. A spokesperson for the Trump campaign described Harris's phone call as cordial. President Joe Biden also called the president-elect and congratulated him on his victory. Now, President Biden expressed his commitment to ensuring a smooth transition and emphasized the importance of working to bring the country together. Donald Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, was elected vice president. So what happens now? Well, over the next several weeks, Donald Trump will be meeting with his team and preparing for the transition of power in January. On January 20th, 2025, Donald Trump will be sworn in as the 47th president in his second inauguration ceremony in Washington, D.C., and will officially take office. We will continue to cover this story for you guys. Lester, back to you. Boy, it's been a history-making week. All right, let's turn now to what's on your mind. And this week, it's about the election and voting. Take a listen. Hi, this is Nora calling from Houston, Texas. Um, why can't kids vote until they're 18 or older? That's a good question. Here with the answer is our good pal, NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss. Believe it or not, it used to be that American kids had to wait until they were 21 years old to vote, not just 18 as they are now. And the reason for that was that the people who wrote the Constitution in the custom of those days thought that you had to get to the age of 21 to have enough wisdom to cast a proper vote in an American election. How did that change? It changed because during World War II, Young Americans were drafted to fight around the world and possibly give their lives. And there began to be a saying by them, which was, if we are old enough to fight, we should be old enough to vote, lower the voting age to 18. Took a couple of decades, but in 1970, President Nixon, who was in the White House at the time said, I know there are young Americans fighting in Vietnam and many of them are under the age of 21. I think the voting age should be lowered to 18. Congress agreed in 1971, our constitution was amended, and ever since then, the vote has been at the age of 18. 
Michael, thanks very much for that. Okay, time now for our pop quiz. The question this week, which city was the first capital of the United States? Was it A, Washington, D.C., B, Philadelphia, or C, New York City? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay, the answer is C, New York City. New York was the very first capital of the United States once the Constitution was ratified. George Washington was inaugurated as the first president of the United States on the balcony of the old City Hall in 1789. The capital was later moved to Washington, D.C. after it was founded in 1790 and named after George Washington, who chose the site. Okay, now to another story making headlines and one you might have heard first here on Nightly News Kids Edition. New York City public school kids will now get an extra school day off before winter break thanks to a petition started by 7th grader Isaac Ragnier. We first introduced you to Isaac back in September. The 13-year-old from Brooklyn, New York, started a petition urging city officials, including the mayor's office, to cancel classes on Monday, December 23rd, so kids, teachers, and staff wouldn't have to report to school for just one day that week before the break. And guess what? It worked. The petition had more than 22,000 signatures. Just days ago, Isaac joined New York City Mayor Adams and others to announce that New York City public school students will get the school day off on December 23rd. Our friend Cameron Lyme spoke with Isaac this week. I saw the update. I saw that you got to meet the mayor. That is unbelievable, man. <laughs> you must be so excited right now. I am. I made a huge success. That you did. That you did. I mean, the fact that you started this petition, you saw it, you said, hey, this needs to change. And then you took it a step further and then you're shaking hands with the mayor. How'd that make you feel? It made me feel so proud. I even got a pizza party at school. Oh, wow. A pizza party. Have kids at your school been talking about it? Yes, they have. Everyone in my class was so proud of me. How does it make you feel to be making such of a big impact? And now that you've made such a huge success, how does that make you feel? It makes me feel like I worked really hard and it was significant. I feel so proud. They're, they're really making a big change. Way to go, Isaac. Okay, time now for our picture of the week. Balloons for the 98th Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade got their first test flight just days ago at Balloon Fest in New Jersey. The annual event gives us a sneak peek of the balloons and also allows handlers to test them out before the big parade. Six new and revamped balloons are a part of a lineup this year, including Minnie Mouse, who will be making her debut. The 98th Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade airs on NBC and streams on Peacock on November 28th. All right, let's head to North Carolina now. It's football season, and there's one member of a college football team who has become a big star for his terrific skills and more. Let's get details from our friend Ann Thompson. Say hello to Ripken, the black lab who has brought the game of fetch to a whole new level. <laughs> With special training by his owner, Michael, the official bat dog for the Durham Bulls minor league baseball team a few years ago. Three, two, and Ripken will carry away Wander Franco's back. Ripken first learned to retrieve. Um, at eight weeks old, we started in our side yard. Um, just working with him, it grew to my college bats, which then grew to Major League Baseball bats. But they knew Ripken's talent hadn't been unleashed yet. Ripken learned to retrieve different things just by um, repetition, right? I could teach him to retrieve a football tee too, kickoff. With that terrific skill, Ripken started fetching tees at NC State football games and quickly became a superstar. Videos of him on social media went viral. Now, no matter the sport, Ripken has become best in show. People take pictures, they ask for his autograph, so I tell everyone Ripken gives me the rights to sign his autograph for him. 
Ripken even has his face on t-shirts. He has his own merch line with three different designs and hoodies and t-shirts and all kinds of fun stuff for the whole family, not just the kids. But most importantly, Ripken gives fans a reason to smile. It's great to see what it does do for the teams, the stadiums, the fans, because it doesn't matter if you're cheering for NC State, the Durham Bulls, or the opposing team. You still want to come up and see Ripken and, and tell him he did a great job, and, and we love that part of it. And since we last caught up with Ripken, he's added another sport to his roster, hockey. Last season, Ripken was invited to drop the ceremonial puck for a special NHL game between the Carolina Hurricanes and the Washington Capitals. Boy, champ. Back at home, Ripken gained a little brother, Champ. They're brothers, full-blooded brothers. Champ's a little goofier than Ripken. Like his big bro, Champ has been training to retrieve teeth. Champ's training started pretty much the same way. Minus the fact that he gets to start at a little higher level because of Ripken here, kind of paved the way. What's next for these retrievers? For Ripken? I think he's got the pros in mind next is the next step. Getting to the pro level. And for his little brother, Champ? I think he'll follow very quickly and, and do a great job following in, in Ripken's paw steps, but he's got big paws to fill, that's for sure. No matter the sport, Ripken and Champ will keep strutting their paws. Ordinary dogs, with extraordinary appeal. Okay, and thanks very much. Turning to this week's Kids Spotlight, if you're a fan of the popular show Young Sheldon, this next segment is for you. Our Kids What's Edition correspondent, Malena, had a chance to sit down with actor Montana Jordan to talk about his role as Georgie Cooper and a new spinoff series. Let's check it out. For fans of the TV show, Young Sheldon. What do you love about working with me? What do you love about working with me? Oh. oh. There's a brand new spinoff starring everyone's favorite brother. Hey y'all, I'm so excited, it's the first day. Montana Jordan, who played Georgie Cooper on Young Sheldon, is reprising the role in CBS's Georgie and Mandy's First Marriage. He sat down with Nightly News Kids Edition to share more. Thank you so much for being here today. Malena, it's great to be here with you. I've been watching Young Sheldon for a while now, and I quickly became a big fan. What can you tell us about the show's premise and a bit about your character? Yeah, I mean, in this new show, we're about, uh, let's see, we are starting three months after Young Sheldon ended. You know, in Young Sheldon, you've seen a younger version of Georgie. You know, he, he might have not have been too mature, and he was getting into all kinds of stuff, but in this new journey, we get to see a more mature George. He's got a lot on his plate. My mail's finally come to this address. Oh, joy. Check it out. What's that? It's my very first credit card. Oh, you never had one before? Nope, Blockbuster card, Subway card, that's it. You've been playing this character, Georgie, for a while now, mm -hmm. and what have you learned? Starting on Young Sheldon, I didn't know what I was getting into, <laughs> you know? I had never, I'd done a movie before Young Sheldon, but I hadn't really been in the big scene of, you know, Hollywood or nothing like that. So I think I'm still learning as I'm on this new journey. Yeah. You know, I think there's always something to learn in this world and, and I'm, uh, I'm always open to it, so. Are we gonna see any of the new Young Sheldon characters in your new show? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I think we are. I think we've seen um, Miss Zoe Perry, the mama, and Miss Annie Potts, the grandmama. Yeah. We've seen them in the first episode, and then Missy Bragging Reward is going to come in the yeah. second episode. And then we also, we filmed a Thanksgiving episode that brought a bunch of people back. So it's always good to have the fam back, and yeah. we're family at the end of the day, and we always have been. So. What's it like filming the show in front of a live audience? Because I know that Big Bang Theory was filmed in front of a live mm -hmm. audience, but Young Sheldon wasn't. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something I've never done before, you know? Have you ever been in an audience before, like in front of an audience? Yeah. Have you? Well, it's pretty nerve-wracking, yeah. <laughs> ain't it? Yeah. I know. Well, on this, we film on Tuesday nights. So every Tuesday night, there's 180 people just looking right at you as, you, as you're working. So that can be pretty nerve-wracking, but it's usually that first take of the night and the first scene. If you're in the first scene and the first take of the night, that's usually the one that's nerve-wracking. But after that, it usually chills out and, and they know you're not perfect. You know, if you mess up, you just go back. And the audience loves when people mess up because they realize we're just human at the end of the yeah. day, so. Hey, 
Hey, welcome to the Cooper residence. Cooper McAllister. Hmm, I'm surprised you put my name first. <laughs> Come on in. So I know that you're a very like, close-knit cast. Um, are you still in touch with any of them? Absolutely. Like I said, we, we've been family ever since the beginning. You know, the first day that I met Ian and Reagan, they were climbing on my back, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of hard to just, you know, after a show ends, it, it's, a, it's a hard thing because we go from going to work together every day to, you know, not, not going to work, to, you know, together. So like I said, we're family at the end of the day, and even outside of work, we still hang out and everything, yeah. so. What got you into acting? Let's see. Well, I never really, when I was younger, I never really had a, a dream of becoming an actor. You know, when you mm -hmm. grow up in a small town, you just, you know, you watch TV. You don't ever really think you would ever be on it. It's not something you really think about. So I'll tell you a quick little story of how I did it. My mom's friend sent her a casting call. Yeah. So I went to a couple different auditions in Texas. And then for that first movie I did, it was in North Carolina. So they flew me out to North Carolina, and my manager found me from that somehow. I don't know how she found me, but she did. And then, um, yeah, she sent me young Sheldon, and I fell in love with the character, and we had so much in common, and, you know, I couldn't help but to try it out. Yeah. So, so what do you have in common with Georgie? Well, you know, when we first started, you know, we both – played football and we both were in you know middle school or and and you know we we're always getting in trouble like a you know like little teenagers do yeah. <laughs> and uh but now it's it's great to you know been playing this character for so long we played on you know seven seasons on young children and and now i get to play a more grown-up version of him and and um so yeah we've we've kind of grown up together that's pretty yeah. nice what's this charge for um a purse just one? A really nice one. What's it like behind the scenes of your TV shows, like Young Sheldon and Georgie and Mandy's first marriage? Yeah, like I said, I mean, we're we're all family at the end of the day and everybody's down to earth and it's nice when you can come into work and you don't have to dread coming into work. You know, yeah. you get to come to work with people you love and, and that's uh, it's pretty amazing that, you get, that I get to do that, so. What's any advice for people who want to become actors when they grow up? I say the biggest part of advice, and um, a lot of people like to steer away from this, um, if you're trying to, you know, impress somebody by, you know, whatever it is. But I think the most important thing is stay true to yourself and and realize who you are and and don't change for anybody, you know, because you don't want people to fall in love with you for somebody you're not, yeah. you know. I want people to love me for who I am. Yeah. And um, I think that's the best part of advice that I can give somebody is just be you. You know, people are going to fall in love with who you are. Melina, that was great. Thanks for sharing that with us. Finally, this is a popular time of year for one fun family activity, getting lost. And by that, I mean those corn mazes across the country. We're revisiting a piece we did last year with our good friend Carrie Sanders on the secrets of these giant puzzles. <laughs> Across the country, spread across acres of cornfields, you will find these walking puzzles, corn mazes. For kids, it's like a giant 3T Nintendo. It's the biggest game board you'll play. And then take that right up. Not this right, but this one. Mazes date back to ancient times. Did you know the first corn maze in the U.S. was built in Anvil, Pennsylvania back in 1993? Since then, corn mazes have become hugely popular in North America. It's just great to get lost. It's great to get back to the farm. It's great to spend some time with your family in a great big game. Getting lost, after all, is part of the fun, even now in the digital age. When families come out there, they kind of put the cell phones away for a little while, and they're actually running around and they're playing, they're talking to each other. It's exercise. So how exactly do you create a corn maze? First, you need to pick a theme or pattern. Next, you prepare the field. You have to plow it or dig up the soil and then harrow it or smooth it out. Then you plant the seeds. Most farmers will strategically plant the seeds in the shape of the pattern. Then in the early fall, once the corn starts to grow, you get in the field and carve out the exact pathways so the maze looks perfect from the sky. Finally, you can open your corn maze for visitors when the corn is about 10 feet tall. 
And now, thanks to high-tech tools, it's a lot easier to build these kind of patterns. You probably have an inkjet printer at home or at school. Farmer Tim Fitzgerald says he uses technology that's actually pretty similar. I think a, a child could look at that and watch their inkjet printer head go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to print a, a color picture. That's the same thing we're doing. We're going back and forth and back and forth across the field, but instead of spraying different colors of ink down onto the paper in a dot matrix pattern, we're planting seeds. Thanks to this kind of technology, today's corn mazes have gotten more complex. There have been zombies, headless horsemen, and even stranger things. The patterns combine block grids and circular patterns. And you know what? Most people tend to be better at navigating one type of pattern over the other. You've got people walking underneath you and they're they're in the block pattern. They're, I'm doing great. I'm feeling great. This is a piece of cake. And then all of a sudden, half an hour later, you'd see them on the, just the what you think are the slow winding pathways and they're pulling their hair out and they, they can't figure out how to get out or or vice versa. So maybe you're good at grid patterns and your brother or sister is good at flowing patterns. You can team up for success. When I think about the maze, it's the only thing that I know of where a family can compete, not against each other, but together. And everybody in the family has the same opportunity to add to the success of the team. And therefore, the family succeeds together. And if you're still not sure if you should visit a corn maze this year, this farmer in Indiana has a message for you. For anyone that wants a family or kids to come and visit a corn maze, I think the most exciting thing is going in and getting lost in nature. And a corn maze allows you to do that. It allows you to experience a different time of the year when the weather's starting to change, the leaves are changing, and to get to step into an experience like this and have fun with your friends uh, and engage with others uh, and try to find your way through an incredible maze like this I think is the most exciting part of this. Getting lost was never so much fun. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. That's going to do it for us. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching, and remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long.